uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shankete, for your very insightful presentation and historical perspective. Um, please, uh, whatever uh, who wants to intervene, if you can use your uh, raise your hand uh, besides uh, in front of your name, so that I can give you the floor and and you can start speak. Who wants to intervene? Okay, but that Rahim, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, actually, I have a question because it's um, it's, uh, it's yeah it's it could be also a synergy uh, with another conflict uh, or another problematic that there is between Muslims and others. Uh, I'm, my question is how to reconcile these relations by knowing all these uh, uh, these problems or these divergence that we have. Uh, the fact that there is uh, many points or many uh, things that, I, for, from 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 a Sunni perspective, I used to see to to hear the people to say, uh, you know, the Shia and they start with uh, some knowledge that they get, I don't know where. But uh, here, by studying the history, we see we see that there is many uh, points of divergence from one side, but from the other side, uh, we have. Uh, mm, we have to reconcile our, our uh, to reconcile with this how to go beyond this divergence so this is my 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 question and uh, and actually when there is a history of uh, co conflict or or um, how we can call them heavy problems it's difficult to 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 go beyond how 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 we can do to 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 do this uh, I don't know if it is clear my question, but uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, can I go ahead? Yes, Bismillah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course. Uh, the, yeah, that's the real question. The real question is how can we overcome this kind of uh, divergence or or conflict, chronic conflict? Uh, I think the principle is very. Uh, first, we have to learn from the history of other nations. Catholic and Protestant were fought each other for 100 years. So they fought each other for 30 years. They fought each other for seven years. You know, the, the seven-year war, the three years war, the hundred years war, and the uh, the religious wars in Europe uh, in the 16th, in the uh, 17th, 18th century are very insi very insightful, very helpful for us to draw lessons from. Um, after all of these wars, they came back to their senses, and they decided to have a social and political system that is based on freedom for all and justice for all. And I think there is no other solution but to provide freedom for all and justice for all. And that's what is needed today to help overcome the sectarian clash between Sunni and Shia. The sectarian clash between Sunni and Shia are not new, but uh, so so is the sectarian problem between uh, Catholic and Protestant and other groups within other religions. So uh, uh, I think we have to avoid judging people based on their belief or treating them based on their belief, uh, regardless of what we believe about other people or your, our opinion about their belief, we have to deal with them first and foremost as a human beings, and we have to treat them fairly. But the problem is not about Sunnism and Shiism within one country. If this war, if this sectarian war is just within one country, so it, it could have been sol solved easily by just having a democratic system that uh, respect the rights of all and uh, guarantee the freedom of religion for all. But the problem today is much more complicated than that. This is a transnational aggression. It's a transnational. It's not, yeah, you can solve the problem between Sunni and Shia and Iraq if Iran was not there by having a democratic uh, system that guarantee for both Sunni and Shia freedom of religion and political participation. 
you could have solved the problem between Alawis and Sunni in, in Syria by having a democratic system that guarantees freedom of religion and political participation for both in Syria. But that, that is not possible today because the Iraqi problem is not purely Iraqi, and the Syrian problem is not purely Syrian, the Yemeni problem is not purely Yemeni. So when you have this uh, transnational problem, I think it has to have some sort of transnational response also. And I believe it's responsibilities of the Sunnis today, and I'm not saying this from a sectarian perspective. I was never sectarian, and I was defending Iran when it was attacked by Iraq and uh, with the support of the Gulf, some Gulf countries. I was, uh, I was uh, always defending Hezbollah against Israelis. I was always support, uh, defending Iran in my articles against also Western countries who were threatening to attack the uh, Iranian nuclear program and other things. But I, I was not a, a sectarian. I'm, I'm saying this just from moral and, and, and ethical perspective. I think it's the responsibility of the Muslim majority today, which are the Sunni, to defend themselves against the Shia aggression, transnational aggression, to stop them, to push Iran back to its borders, and then to have reconciliation based on fairness and justice between these communities. Allahu Alam. Thank you, Dr. Shafiq. Uh, does anyone else have a remark or intervention? Yes, please go ahead, Padre Mahadani. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, a question, Dr. Champetti. There is a sentence uh, uh, which gets my, uh, my attention in your introduction of, uh, of your book, uh, the, uh, the Impact of Crusades on Sunni Shia uh, Relation. Uh, you said that the, the historical examination of uh, the the causes of those the, the disconnection between Shia and, and Sunni uh, uh, prove that the, 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 those causes are not uh, religious but political, uh, so, uh, ethnic, ethnical and uh, cultural. Could you explain more uh, that because because uh, uh, till Still before the beginning of Arab Spring, uh, we have had this idea that uh, the, the disconnection is, uh, first of all, uh, a religious, uh, a rich difference be between Sunnah and Shia. Uh, and you, are, you have proven uh, by your studies that uh, the cause, uh, in fact, are more political than uh, theological or, or religious. Could you? Please explain more. That's Barakallahu Fik. Okay, Barakallahu Fik. Uh, no problem. I, I think uh, I, I think the religious differences were never a cause of of clash or war between people, unless there is some injustice involved. As as I said in the introduction of the book that you read, no, Allah, if I remember the 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 word in in Arabic, no. الخلاف الديني لا يتحول صراعا إلا إذا لابسه ظلم. That the religious differences doesn't transform into a conflict. There is there is difference between difference and conflict. خلاف and صراع. We can have خلاف differences without having صراع conflict. So how our differences are transformed into صراع into conflict. These happen only when injustice is involved, especially political injustice. So yes, people can believe with different belief, can can live together with different beliefs. And this, uh, all, all the Islamic history actually proved that we have we have uh, a dis we have uh, 
a, a continuous Christian existence within the Islamic world since the beginning of Islam till today in Egypt, in Syria, in many other Muslim countries. There, there is a continuous Jewish existence within the Islamic world in Yemen since the time of Prophet till today. Why, why Muslims tolerated Jewish communities, Zoroastrian communities, uh, Christian communities throughout 15 or 14 centuries? Because there is no political uh, element involved here. There is no political injustice involved here. The Christians and Jew, Jews and, and Zoroastrians within the Islamic world, they know their political limitations. They never try to expand politically at the ex expense of the majority of Muslim, the Ummah. While the Shia are different. The Shia are always trying to expand at the expense of the Ummah. But the, the time when they don't have a strong political entity, they don't have strong political state, they coexist very peacefully with the Sunnis. When they have a political strong entity, a political strong state, they start the expansion. This is what we found in the history of the Fatimid Empire, the Safavid Empire, and the modern Iranian state. So at the end of the day, yes, there, there, there is the, the, main, the main problem is, is political expansion and political injustice. Yes, there are also other social, sociological and cultural issues involved. When the, the center of gravity of Shiism was in the Arab world, as in the time of the Crusades, which I study in details, the, the Sunni and Shia relation during the Crusades. Because at that time, the, the center of gravity of Shiism was in the Arab world, there, there is no much uh, confrontations, or at least the confrontation was less serious between Sunnis and Shia. But when the center of gravity of Shiism migrated to Iran, here the, 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 the doctrinal differences were aggravated by the ethnic differences also. I mean, you have now both the Sunni and Shia difference plus the Persian Arab ethnic problems. So here the cultural and sociological element also uh, is involved and causing some problems. But still, the, the, the issue is not about faith. The issue is about justice. It is an ethical issue. It's not a theological issue. You can coexist with anyone who has any kind of belief or who has no belief at all in any religion, but you cannot coexist with someone who's, who's committing massive injustice against you and against your people. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to speak? Please use raise your hand because I am muting everyone to avoid the black and the noise. If you want to intervene, uh, please raise your hand. <laughs> Anyone else but uh, Badr Abrahim? <laughs> okay. If, if they are okay, go ahead, Badr Abrahim. I can ask my question, inshallah. Uh, so, coming uh, back to the practic practical things that we can do, because uh, your explanations, uh, you know, about uh, from 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 um, from public institution, like how uh, the state should protect. Uh, uh, the freedom of religion, freedom of, uh, uh, yeah, about freedoms and uh, rights. But coming from the bottom, from our side, what we can do, how we can deal with, uh, with this situation, how, how it could be our contribution on the ground, for example. 
I think two things, uh, because we we should have a short-term plan and a long-term plan. I mean, they, they have to be a short-term solution and a long-term solution. The, the, the short-term solution is to stop Iran and the transnational shiism from expanding in the other countries and trying to dominate other countries by using Shia minorities in the Arab world. This is the practical, the urgent, the short-term plan. But it's not enough. Even if we stop Iran from expanding today, even if we get rid of, of uh, the Alawi sectarian regime today, that will not solve problems. That is just a short-term solution. The long-term solution has to be start creating, again, political system that guarantees justice for all, freedom for all. And also, a third element, very, very important, is to have some law that that uh, stop any kind of incitement or tahrid against against the other group. Uh, the culture of hatred and incitement uh, is the root cause of all of this, and it has to be stopped. So intellectuals need to uh, both to be committed intellectual today and to contribute stopping the aggressor, but more important to contribute to enlighten people about the roles of coexistence and the right of everybody to be treated based on fairness, and freedom, and justice. So this is what, what we need to, to, to do. We need to work on the short term, stopping the aggressor by any means that we have. Everyone can contribute to this. And, on the, and also, we have to create a culture of coexistence again in these societies because there are very deep wounds in the society today that won't be held easily and we have to work on that in uh, some strategic cultural and, and uh, religious activities that bring people back to their senses and to their human brotherhood. Allahu Uh, okay, uh, Sister Maha, you can go ahead, please. I think uh, Sister Ozan is not hearing us. Uh, Maha, what is... Uh, okay. Maha? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, go ahead. yes, yes, uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sankiti, for this uh, very insightful presentation. I have a very uh, simple question. Uh, it's related to the, to the way I feel as an individual towards this question of Shi'i. Shi um, uh, it happened to me in many opportunities to be a present in uh, in a community where the preacher was talking about Shia and uh, saying uh, uh, and saying so many things about them. And it, it happened even in, uh, uh, I mean, during uh, Salat al-Eid here in Morocco, in the city of Fez. And, uh, uh, well, how could I respond to this when I want to explain to my kids, when I want to explain to people around me that this, well, Shia might have a di different aqidah, but at the same time, how can we uh, reconcile, which implies don't feel hatred towards Shia, when at the moment when everybody is telling us that they have a, a false aqidah or aqidah fasida, and uh, uh, this is one point. The second point, do they constitute a threat? Uh, as you said, that they want to expand and that they have this idea of expansion inside the, the Islamic, uh, uh, the, the Muslim countries. How can we uh, consider this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think for the first part of your question, we, we have to explain to people that uh, this is very this kind of uh, hatred language is counterproductive. Number one, and it's not Islamic. Also, uh, even if you are fighting someone who is committing aggression against you, this kind of language doesn't help actually. Especially if you are fighting within the Muslim community itself, two groups. Two groups. At the end of the day, she are. Shia, Shia, Shia Muslims, and 
you, you cannot prevent anybody from being a Muslim if he decides to be a Muslim in any way. Uh, and even if they are not Muslim, I think this kind of language is not really helpful. So what we need to do, yes, we have to recognize that there is a real problem with, between Sunni and Shia. We have to recognize that there is a, a g aggression and expansion from Shia minority today against the Muslim majority. Uh, this is this is a fact that regardless of our uh, good intention about rapprochement between Sunni and Shia, we, we have to start from the reality. The reality is there are deep problems between the two groups, that there are real Shia aggression and expansion today, in this moment we're speaking, uh, against the Sunnis. So, uh, but that uh, doesn't mean that we should not be wise in dealing with problem. What we need to do is to solve problem without making it worse, to, to follow the wisdom here by containing the problem instead of exp uh, you know, spreading the file. So, uh, yeah, you know, some preachers, of course, they, they don't have much knowledge of Islam. They don't have much knowledge of Islamic history, uh, much less they know about politics and political wisdom. Uh, but, well, still you are you are as you know intellectuals can can say your your opinion clearly on that and explain it uh are shia threat today yes they are uh for some societies they are not only threat they are existential threat you know for the the sunni community in iraq for example about to be eradicated the sunni majority of syria is about to to be eradicated half of the Syrians today, whether dead or outside their country, uh, because of this Shia, not, not only Assad regime, not only Iranian, it's a Shia transnational war. There are Lebanese Shia fighting in, in Syria, there are Afghani Shia fighting in Syria, there are Iraqi Shia fighting in Syria. So, yes, this is a real threat to very important countries and nations who are at the heart of the Islamic world and at the heart of the uh, Arab world. Yes, Shia are a threat, threat at least to the neighbor, to the countries who are neighboring Iran. And the, uh, you can say they are a very serious threat to all of the Arab region that from the Gulf to the Mediterranean, at least. Yes, they are not threat in North Africa. They are not threat to the to Egypt or Maghreb, to Indonesia or Malaysia, but they are threat to people of the Arabian Peninsula and people of the Levant. So, yes, they are, and we have to deal with this threat. Uh, but again, have to be have to deal with it within the Islamic principles and also with the maximum political wisdom that we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Badr Harun, uh, Badr Harun. So is yours. So is yours. Uh, so, uh, but uh, can you use the, the headphone? Headphone. Do not have the but, echo. Have the but, echo. By, by the way, uh, by the way, Zainab, if I can add just a few sentences. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, if I can uh, just add a few sentences to the uh, to to the answer that. Oh, okay. I just gave. Excuse me. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry. sorry. Uh, I thought you finished. No, it's fine. Sorry. It, it's fine. Uh, yeah, I finished. I just okay. forgot something I, I want to say again. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the one of the Lebanese academician who's who's a Christian, not not Muslim, is not Sunni or Shia, has a you know a, a small but important book called. Tehdaf Ahl Sunnah, targeting the Sunnis. And so it's a book published in Arabic. It's available online. And uh, this uh, Lebanese Christian academician, professor, Nabil Khalifa, he, he, he can see the issue very clearly from just geopolitical point of view. And what he's saying in the book is that actually all the Sunnis from the Gulf to the Mediterranean are targeted and they are in real trouble because of this Shia expansion. 
And this is a testimony from someone who is not Muslim, who is not Sunni, and who is not involved in this sectarian uh, tension between Sunnis and Shias. Just to, to, to give you an example of how serious the issue is today. Allahu alam. Yes, go ahead, Zainab. Okay. Uh, and uh, give the floor to Dr. Harun. Uh, uh, shukran, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Good, yes, we can hear you. Good, Go ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of technological problems, I've only joined you very recently. So uh, uh, I've missed uh, a lot of the argument, but I have uh, picked up the gist of it, and I, I see uh, in some places where it's going. And um, I, I'm very encouraged to hear that um, the issue is not really a conflict uh, of different religious sects. That's not the main issue, because uh, it, it seems that everyone is of consensus that freedom of religion is very important and that uh, coexistence is very important. And this is also something that's very dear to my heart because uh, uh, I'm very keen to see unity in the Ummah. But um, uh, uh, the, the problem seems to be uh, uh, one of aggression. And um, uh, my question is, uh, who is actually committing the aggression? And I'm not at all convinced that the aggression is, is coming from uh, uh, mainly from the Shia. Uh, so this is a difference of opinion, and uh, uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to be in a minority here, but I feel quite strongly about this. And, uh, you, you know, we can go back historically and look at all sorts of things, but uh, there are lots of indications that the aggression is not primarily coming from the Shia. And uh, what was what was uh, mentioned a bit earlier was the Iran-Iraq war. And uh, this was not a minor incident. It was a, a major confrontation. Uh, and certainly um, it wasn't uh, instigated by the Shia. It wasn't Shia aggression. And um, uh, the comment was that, uh, that the, the, uh, the, the aggression was uh, not from the Shia in the beginning, but then afterwards it was. And I think that this is also the debate. So, um, yeah. uh, I mean, for example, I've just got a, 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 a news item that I've just picked up in the last day or two, and it's talking about uh, the Saudi position, and it says that uh, Turkey al Faisal has been leading a rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia rooted in their common hostility towards Iran. Warming embrace included a high-level delegation to Israel led last summer by former Saudi General Anwar uh, Eshki. Um, and then we have the World Economic Forum where Turkey at Al-Fatul met with uh, Tipi Livni in a, in a recent meeting. So uh, it, it seems that there's collaboration between uh, uh, many groups in the, 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 in the Sunni uh, part of the world and uh, so that uh, um, it's not only coming from one side, but um, uh, and it's quite a complex thing. You know, if you look at the history of Iran and the recent history, what's happened there, they were under occupation. Uh, um, the uh, Americans had the hegemony uh, before the revolution. So there, there are lots of issues here. So, um, you know, it's also a matter of are uh, uh, we looking at geopolitics and are the Iranians uh, defending themselves, or are they being more aggressive than any other group in the, in the area? Thank you very much. You I, very think, much. I, uh, think... I, I agree with you that aggression was not always from the Shia side. I, uh, I had the chance to study the Sunni-Shia relation from the beginning of Islam until today. I know at least a little bit about when this side was aggressive and was the other side was uh, was attacked. And it happened from both sides throughout history. But if you talk about what's happening today, uh, I don't think anybody who wants to see can miss the fact that 
that half a million Syrians were killed with the involvement of Shia Iranian, Shia Iraqi, Shia Lebanese, Shia uh, Afghans, and there's half a million human beings were killed because they just want a fair and free government in their country. So I, I don't see here room for justification, actually. Yes, Iran was attacked by Iraq, and that was a huge aggression. I, I agree with you. And actually, I wrote about a lot. I wrote a lot about that. But does that justify for Iran to destroy Syria, to kill half a human being in Syria, or to try to occupy Yemen? Uh, I, I doubt it. So there is something here that we need, I think, more honesty about it. So some kind of self-examination and, and humbleness is very important here, too. If we want to live together, uh, we cannot defend what Iran and what the Shia in general, Shia elites, I'm not talking about ordinary common Shia living their life. I'm talking about Shia political and religious elites throughout uh, the region. Uh, what we're living today is a transnational Shia aggression against the majority of this Ummah in those in several countries. Yes. They were unjust. There are a lot of injustices that have been committed against the Shia throughout history. There are a lot of injustices that are committed about uh, Shia in recent history. And we are not justifying that at all. But none of that justifies what's happening today. Number one, if Iran wants to take revenge from Iraq, so that, that has nothing to do with Syria. Syria was these Syrians were supporting Iran during the Iraq-Iran war. So what the Syrian people did to Iran to devastate their country and to make them refugees, half of their population refugees. But Syria was one of the Arab countries that was supporting Iran throughout the Iraq-Iran war. There is something much more than just a simple uh, uh, politics between countries. I can understand that Iranians have revenge against Iraq. So, so I believe that, yes, Iraq was the aggressor at the beginning of war, but Khomeini insistent not to stop the war was also an aggression, because he was refusing reconciliation that all the world was calling for, including the Arab world, including the Islamic Organization of uh, the Islamic Cooperation Organization, United Nations, many, the, many resolution of the of the Security uh, Council uh, asking Iran to, for ceasefire, and several years, blood is flowing because of the Khomeini stubbornness on this. So I think um, a sense of honesty is very important here. If uh, if you believe that Iran has the right to invade Syria, to to invade Yemen, and to control Iraq, so there is no room for coexistence here. The only option for the Sunnis is just to fight back and the war will continue. And I believe from the, what I read on history that at the end of the day, the minority will lose. And that's what happened before and that's what will happen. Again, one of the main results, maybe the main results of my study on the Sunni Shia relation during the Crusades, two centuries of the Crusades, is that the Shia, at the end of the day, the Crusades caused the Shiism. The end of well, well, the Shiism ended uh, in southern Mediterranean in in Egypt, and and almost ended in the eastern Mediterranean in Syria. And one of the reasons is because of the role of the Nizari Shia during the Crusades, and the way they. They assassinated many uh, Sunni leaders during the Crusades, and they created this this image that they are aligning with the enemy of 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 Muslims. Same thing happened also when the the alliance with the Mongol invasion of that is still creating the Shia image today. So uh, I think, to be honest, if if a minority and also to be realistic. If a minority believe that they can't control the majority forever, that's just stupid because that won't happen. Yes, they might have a day for revenge, 
And these revengeful memories very deep in Shia culture, as I explained at the beginning. But revenge doesn't create states and societies and doesn't achieve uh, justice and coexistence and fairness. Yes, the Shia have the right to be respected. They have the right to have freedom of religion. They have the right to be treated fairly and dignity as a human beings. But they don't have the right to try as a minority to control the Islamic world. They have no right to try to impose the uh, dictatorship of a minority in Syria or a dictatorship of a minority in Yemen or to recruit Iran, recruiting Shia from all around the world to come and to kill Syrians on their own land. That is not a way to achieve coexistence. If the Shia believe that's fine and that's their right, so they will continue, the minority will lose at the end of the day. Allahu Akbar. Thank you. Uh, I just have one remark before giving the floor to Brother Mohammed Yanin. Actually, uh, this uh, proposition defended by uh, Brother Harun, we can find it in many, uh, many other personalities who are actually very active in the Palestinian conflict. If when we see in the social media, Facebook and the Twitter, the, the many many activist people who are very very uh, very uh, active in the Palestinian conflict, they are uh, taking position uh, in in uh, <laughs> in the like uh, they are supporting the, the the Shia here because. Because the, the, they were supporting the Palestinian state and Hamas, and uh, they said they were supporting them. So now, they, even if uh, Iran is committing a uh, aggression in Syria and many other places, they are still defending it. So uh, I think they are using their uh, the fact that they were helping uh, the Palestinians. Very uh, well, 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 here to get support from from the others. Don't know what you think. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, I understand. But uh, this this has to be put in into a relative perspective. I can support Iran in her policy, uh, in her Palestinian policy, but that will not make me, and cannot make me morally justify her role in killing half a million Syrians. You know more than what Israel killed of Palestinians in in 70 years. Uh, that this is just a, a moral self contradiction that nobody could have. If Iran starts f fighting Israel t tomorrow, I will be first one to volunteer and to fight with him and to defend. Same thing that we were defending Hezbollah and we were attacking those who are attacking Hezbollah in the Arab media, uh, at least in the Saudi media. Because we, it's not about, we, we have no problem with Shia as a Shia. We have no problem with Christian because of their Christian belief, with the Shia because of their Shia belief, or because of the Shia ritual. It's about justice and injustice. The way we, we like Iran in on Palestinian issue is because it's supporting justice. The way we hate Iran on the Syrian issue because it's supporting injustice. And there is no contradiction here. We just you just have a principle, which is you are with those who are who have a just cause against those who are committing injustice, regardless of religion, doctrine, madhab, ethnicity, nationality, or any other factor. That's all irrelevant here. But those who want to forgive Iran, everything, the atrocity she, uh, Iran is committing in Iraq, the atrocities Iran is committing in Syria. Uh, the, the, the aggression Iran is committing in Yemen and the, the militias creating everywhere, the disorder and bloody conflict that is creating everywhere because Iran is sending a few missiles to Hamas, 
that or to Islamic Jihad, Palestinian Jihad. That's nonsense. Uh, I think nobody who has any moral principles should do that. Uh, even Hamas itself is now distancing itself from Iran because they, they just cannot justify that. With all of the Iran support they're having, and they're having, and they're still having a lot of support from Iran, by the way, money and arm and expertise, etc. But they cannot, they cannot justify for Iran. They cannot justify for the uh, Assad regime. The first thing Iran, the Hamas leadership did is to get out of Damascus when Assad regime started killing his, his people. Because I cannot defend my people, my people by, by justifying a slaughter of, of other people. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Yes, there are some people I think they just uh, don't know details. Some people who are still uh, keeping that old perception of Iran, revolutionary Iran, uh, fighting imperialism, fighting Israel. That's not Iran anymore. Yes, we have to be proud of what Iran achieved in the past, but we have to be awake also of what Iran is doing today. That is justice and fairness. Allahu Alam. Uh, I couldn't agree more anymore with you. It was just a remark about what I'm noticing, and it is striking me a lot when I see that on the internet. Uh, if I can give the floor to Mohammed Lani, please go ahead. Barakallahu um, fikr, Sister I have a question to Dr. Shamfeti and a uh, comment at the same time, a political uh, question and comment. You highlighted the importance of freedom as condition to reconciliate uh, the, the, to co the two continents uh, of our Ummah Sunnah and Shia. Uh, peoples normally have uh, or must have to, the right to self-determination. This is the condition uh, to reconciliate Shia and Sunnah uh, again as they lived together for many centuries. Uh, you speak about the condition within the Shia camp, which is a, a, a right, but what about the other camp, I, I mean the Sunni camp, especially the Arab Gulf countries. Uh, it is that the, uh, in this uh, region of uh, Islamic world, I mean the Gulf countries, uh, the, um, the sensitivity against uh, Shia is high uh, than uh, another, another regions. But at the same time, uh, we have a, um, a lack of freedom uh, to, uh, within these, uh, these countries. And uh, uh, this condition to reconciliate uh, Shia and Sunnah uh, will, uh, will uh, never be uh, 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 ready. Uh, I mean, pushing Iran into its border is having uh, uh, freedom in population in, Sun uh, in Sunni countries, in Sunni population, uh, calling, uh, whom could do that. This condition is not. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, present. Could you uh, g give us a comment about the other camp, the freedom in the other camp? I mean, the the, the Arab countries, especially Gulf countries, and Egypt, as is, is one of the biggest Arab and Muslim countries now. Barakallahu uh, Barakallahu Thanks so much. I think this is a very important question because we have to look at the issue from the two sides of the coin, as as they said. Um, Yes, the culture of hatred is, is very deep in the, on the two sides, the two coasts of the Gulf, actually, the eastern side and the western side of the Gulf. Uh, there are a lot of bad perception from the Sunnis in the Gulf against the Shia, and there are a lot of bad perception from the Shia against the Sunnis, from the Arab against Persians, from the Persian against the Arab. This is a very deep cultural divide that we can uh, study in literature, in history, it's very long. I, I talk about it in a study that I wrote on the, I talk about the, the, the Persian image in the Arab poetry and the, and the uh, Arab image in the Persian poetry. And it's, it's very deep and it's very bad. There are a lot of bad perception, a lot of stereotypes. And I think Muslims have to talk about this 
you know, some Muslims are obsessed of how the West is, and Western people are looking at the at Muslims, but they don't see the stereotypes that that are there between the Persian and the Arab, or the Turks and the Persians, or the Kurds and the Arabs, etc. And this, to me, is is more important because it's related to what we have our our, our own illness. But again, we have to distinguish between theoretic, theoretical, abstract position and practical aggression. I mean, you can have a Sunni Shia who who, are, who is attack insulting Shia in his sermons and saying that Shia are traitors and kuffar, etc. But He's, he's not taking his arm to kill Shia. At the same time, you will find a Shia sheikh or saying the same about the Sunnis, adding to that that he has his Kalashnikov and volunteering in the Hashd army in Iraq, for example, or volunteering in somewhere else. So we have to separate here the, the action. Yes, it's very sad to have stereotypes and negative perception between Muslims, but it's much worse to have them shedding the blood of each other. If you are insulting me, there is still a big difference between insulting me and killing me. What we're talking about today is death, is murder. It's not just stereotypes. It's not just takfir. Yes, takfir might lead to murder, but we have takfir from both sides, number one. And number two, you have those who are committing both takfir and, and murder at the same time. So we, we need just to see the, the whole picture. Yes, for the future to solve problem in a radical way, we need some sort of cultural transformation to get rid of all of these stereotypes, or at least as much as possible. But that is, again, a long-term process, a long-term plan. But what we have today is much more urgent than that. We have millions of people who are expelled from their country. We have 100,000 people who have been murdered. And much of that is done by Iran and the Iran expansion in the Arab world, in the Arab countries. The Shia expansion within the Sunni realm, that is the fact. So yes, Saudi Arabia is not innocent, and the Saudi culture is, is not doing good to all of this is one of the main causes of the problems of sectarianism is the Saudi religious culture. That is a very narrow-minded uh, culture in, in terms of looking at other Muslim groups. Yes, I agree with that, definitely. But Iran, by the way, has the same culture. Iranians are not talking nicely about Sunnis. They are not talking nicely about the Sunni freedom. They are not giving freedom even to the, their, their Sunni minorities. Why the Sunnis have no mosque in Tehran? So the difference here is that Iran has militia working, I mean, killing and murdering people in Syria, in Yemen, uh, in Iraq. But Saudi Arabia doesn't have militia of Sunni Iranians to kill the Iranian people and to destroy the Iranian institutions. So here, we cannot make them equal here. Yes, both of them are responsible, but there is a difference in this respons level of responsibility. I cannot equate, again, insult with murder. There are people who are insulting others, there are people who are murdering others. What we need today is to stop the murderers. Wallahu You have to leave now, Dr. Shinkati. I understand. Yeah, definitely. Yes. I'm sorry for that, but I have to. No, 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 no problem. No problem. So, uh, thank you so much for your very insightful intervention and uh, for replying to all the, the questions. Uh, I think it's a uh, the, this conflict is much more understandable for all of us after this. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. May Thank Allah you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm very honored to be with you. And thanks a lot again. Thank you. Okay. Salam alaikum. Ma salama. Ma salama. Ma salama.